Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And here's today's question. How many of you have reached the same point in your journey as filmmakers as I just have? As in, I want, no, that's not the right word. Really, the word is need internal neutral density filters, but refuse to buy the dedicated video cameras that have them. I bet it's a lot of you. That's because the latest hybrid video centric cameras from Sony, Panasonic, and Fuji the A9, A7, R3, A7 III, GH5, G9, GH5S, and now the X-H1, in fact, the entire mirrorless space for that matter, are no longer oddities, curiosities, or uncertain bets. They are the future. They are the now, really. And there's no turning back. They are incredibly compelling. I also bet a lot of you must be thinking some of the same things I'm thinking, like, because they're mirrorless, these top-end hybrids have the same kind of focus and exposure assists as vastly more expensive dedicated video cameras. And we're using them. And because they're mirrorless and vying for DSLR shooters used to optical finders, their manufacturers are keen to eliminate the optical finder advantage and are leveraging the economies of scale at this end of the market to deliver EVFs superior to those in vastly more expensive dedicated video cameras. We've come to rely on them. And if you don't like their built-in EVFs, hey, that's fine. Every one of these hybrid cameras will now connect to the best external monitors out there via HDMI. We know this because we're using them, too. Most of these hybrids have Super 35 or full-frame sensors. Now, as good or better than all but the very highest end cine cameras. As good or better dynamic range, definitely better high ISO performance. Now, if this far into 2018 you're still going to sniff at Micro Four Thirds sensors and don't want to take my word for it, just ask an ARRI or RED operator who's worked with the GH5S what he or she thinks about the image quality of that little guy. These hybrids may not have the codecs, bit depth, or raw recording capabilities of the biggest big boys. But in the age of web delivery, it doesn't matter nearly as much as many of us would like to think, unless you're Netflix. But then that's not us. These cameras have in-body image stabilization. You know that, that the big boys don't. Autofocus that the big boys don't. Though we also all know that not all AF is created equal. They are all dramatically smaller than the big boys, lighter, capable of being used in tight spaces where the big boys can't go. Yet, these hybrids can take advantage of the very same technology by the same manufacturers used in the biggest Hollywood productions, like gimbals, to get the same, unheard of just a few years ago, fluidly dynamic shots. With lens adapters. These cameras can be used with the exact same lenses as the biggest big boys. And these cameras are selling like, okay, it's a cliche, hotcakes. These cameras, you know, they actually tease us, taunt us, inspire us, whisper to us, make real films, make good films, make meaningful films. And again, as every one of you knows who's watching this already, they do so for the tiny fraction of the price of dedicated cameras that we can actually afford, which gets us to the need and economics of neutral density filters and why it's time to stop prioritizing crazy high ISO performance that we might use, what, at most, most 10% of the time, and prioritize instead things that will help us shoot in daylight internal neutral density filters. I mean, what's the point of the f1.4 lenses we own and are comfortable with from our photography days if we can't use them in daylight without futzing around to get that shallow depth of field, which is equal parts aesthetics and narrative support? What's the point of super speed cine glass? Wait, right. They're either designed, assuming the cameras to which they'll be attached already have internal NDs, or are supported by crew who don't mind setting up, taking down, swinging open, or carrying the added weight of stonking heavy multi-stage matte boxes. 
which I admit, as the words are coming out of my mouth, sound kind of envious and whiny, and that would be because they are. But then there's this. How many of us indie and one or two man bands are happy spending as much or more than what a camera or lens costs to outfit our gear with external NDs uh, and perhaps uh, the matte boxes that hold them? In fact, how many of us are happy screwing around with them at all when we're on a shoot? How many of us are happy with the color shifts we often see in even otherwise highly regarded brand neutral density filters? Now, it's not as though I'm coming to NDs for the first time. It's not like I haven't used screw-in NDs before. It's just that now I need neutral density filters much more often, and neither the math nor logistics work well for me. As always, your mileage may vary. Let's take, for example, the current Sony and Panasonic base kits we use here at Three Blind Men and an Elephant. We own a Sony A6300 and Sony's E 50mm f1.8, FE 28mm 2.0, and FE 24-105 f4 lenses. We own a Panasonic GH5 with Pani Leica DG15 1.7, the Sigma 30 1.4, and the Olympus 75 1.8. All of this is incredible image making gear. Now, if we want to shoot wide open, and that's a primary though not only reason we bought these particular lenses in the first place, they're so tiny. We're talking a minimum, minimum of five different sized ND 2.4 filters along with zoom adapter kits. Though, in fact, I wasn't even able to find a 46 millimeter zoom. Why 2.4, which is eight stops? Because using the Sunny 16 rule, f1.4 is seven stops from f16. And since these cameras can get down to ISO 100 before going into extended mode, I think we need an additional stop to get to the 1 50th of a second shutter speed we prefer because we shoot at 24 frames per second. Why single value instead of variable NDs? Well, because that would save us money if we used step up or step down rings, but we don't like them because they always prevent us from using lens hoods and they can sometimes cause vignetting. Because variable NDs cost a lot more than single density filters because variable NDs get funky at the margin with that signature X effect though maybe the new Nisi uh, will really beat that. Because variable NDs are difficult, call it impossible, to adjust inside lens hoods. Because, on the other hand, we don't mind adjusting ISO 2 or even 3 stops from ISO 100 as it becomes overcast or a little later or earlier in the day. And because if we have to compensate for the decrease in contrast or increased flare that we usually see when shooting without hoods by going to matte boxes, we might as well just go to square filters and matte boxes while we're at it. When we do the math, it can easily come out to over $800 in individual filter and filter adapters for just these six lenses at just one single density because they've all got different filter threads. If at some point we go to Sigma 1.8s or Fujinon T 2.9 zooms, all four of which are incredible glass, we're talking a minimum of two more filters at 72 and 82 millimeters plus zoom adapters. Call it a grand then, though once we get to the T2.9s, we'd probably opt for ND 2.1 or 1.8, seven and six stops respectively. Call it closing in on another half grand at least if we decide to shoot in light, which forces us to use an ISO higher than we want while still maintaining shallowest depth of field. Alternatively, and this is how we're leaning at the moment, we could buy some version of a matte box light, possibly the Genus Tech, possibly the Bright Tangerine Misfit Atom, uh, maybe wooden cameras Zipbox, to any one of which we'd add at least a French flag and a 4x4 ND 2.4 filter. Again, if we went to the Fujinons or to the Pani Leica Zooms, the 8 to 18, 12 to 60, and 50 to 200, we'd have to add a couple more filters since their slower maximum apertures would require an ND 2.1, possibly a 1.8. Which, interestingly enough, could set us back as much as a grand as well, at least to start. Yet would yield a rig much less nimble, much more conspicuous and, and heavier. Which is exactly the opposite of what make, in large part, these hybrids so attractive to us. Which brings us back to internal NDs. Now, if you guys didn't already have a solution, if you don't already have a solution, I'm very curious about what you've done or what you think, so please let me know in the comments section below. And today, you were willing to budget, say, a thousand bucks for neutral density, which way would you want to go? Screw in filters, matte box with filter stage and rectangular filters, or twisting a dial on your Sony Pani or Fuji hybrid camera to change your internal neutral density? 
Or would you just let the shutter speed ride all the way up? Which I was willing to do of necessity when we were in Vegas, but I wouldn't choose to do so again. Interesting that a thousand dollars also happens to be the likely difference, give or take 300 bucks, between Sony's killer new A7 III and what could be, if they wanted it to be, the next A7S III. In other words, for me, it's a no brainer. I'd much rather have the small form factor, lightweight, and ease of use of an internal ND equipped hybrid going so far as to trade one of our cameras in and paying even more because of the depreciation hit I'd take to get it. Here's the thing. Sony could do it. They could do it right now. They've already got electronic variable neutral density filters in their FS5 and FS7 too. And at this point, really, what are they going to do for an A7S 3 Give us ISO 1 kajillion? I'd rather have an ISO of 0.5. I'd rather have internal neutral density filters instead of 10-bit. 422, raw, ProRes, higher burst rates, bigger buffer, higher res EVF, tilty rear LCD, headphone jack. I'd even sacrifice unlimited recording. Remember, too, even the little RX105 offers a three step internal ND. Canon could do it in their rumored first real professional mirrorless camera because they've already done it in their Cinema EOS line using the existing flange distance of the EF series lenses. As is Panasonic, come to think of it, using the same EF mount on their EVA1. I'd take an internal ND on a GH6 over better autofocus. How about you? If Sony and Panasonic continue not to offer internal NDs in their flagship hybrids, but Canon delivered it in their rumored camera, would you consider switching if those are the brands you already shoot with? If you're already a Canon shooter on the verge of switching, would that be enough to keep you in the fold? I'd consider switching back to Canon. Well, at least adding to our kit. For those of you who are wondering, hey, why don't you consider a dedicated camcorder like the excellent Sony Z90 or Canon 405 or a bridge camera like the also excellent Panasonic FZ, FX 2500, all of which do have built-in NDs? The simple answer is I have. But the variable maximum aperture of each, when combined with their one-inch sensor, even wide open, yield depth of field full-frame equivalents of anywhere between F8 and F12. Again, wide open. It just doesn't help all that much for what I do, except when I'm covering live events outside. But even then, the depth of field is an issue. But that's another story for another time. There is at least one other way of doing this. What if lens manufacturers started building the electronic variable NDs into their lenses, powered through the contacts to the camera body? What do I know? The bottom line is that the first company to offer internal neutral density filters in these kinds of cameras is going to have a huge advantage over the camera manufacturers who don't. Sony may be best positioned because of their existing electronic variable ND tech. Canon may be best positioned because they have a clean sheet of paper for a mirrorless body and the flange distance they might need with their existing lens lineup for a mechanical ND setup. Panasonic may be the best position because they've been by far the most aggressive in making the most capable video machines in this class, and they look very hungry. It's time. We've got NAB in a week. Photokina in the fall. I really hope we see someone put a neutral density filter inside one of these cameras this year. Anyway, that's what I think. What do you think? For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.